Franklin here for Hyper Annotations 3.0, the public art program for the Venice Biennale for Triple Ampersand. And today we're here with artist and writer Hito Steyer. We're very happy to have you here. Um, I'd like to jump right in and ask you how you feel about uh, this uh, edition's theme of the Biennale of Foreigners Anywhere, and how does this meet you within your personal practice, if, uh, if at all? Well, you know, I was really surprised to be included in brackets because mm -hmm. I only realized six weeks ago. So, mm -hmm. it, yeah, it was kind of a surprise. Mm -hmm. But I'm only involved in the scope of an archive, which is called Disobedience Archive. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd say it's some kind of subsection, and my work <laughs> is from 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So it's, well, it's kind of flashback, let's put it like that, for mm -hmm. me personally. Yeah. Yeah. So to give a little bit of context, uh, this is the Disobedience Archive started in 2005 by uh, yes. Marco Sottini, started in Berlin, and it's an evolving archive with artworks and on the verge of political activism and um, discourse as well. Mm -hmm. And each, this is, I think, already the 15th time that this archive has been, has been shown, and each time it changes a, around a little bit. So. I'd like to ask you, how has this archive evolved for you over the years, over the different times that it's been shown? I don't think that my work has been included in every iteration, mm -hmm. so I can just talk about the yeah. times it's been shown. Yes, <laughs> it's evolved. I'm not entirely sure how, but um, what I appreciate is the consistency, you mm -hmm. know, of dealing with a basically stock of um, archival material and adding on to it. And I think, especially, especially now, you know, 20 years from its start, it start really acquiring historical value mm -hmm. or mm, revealing, you know, aspects which, were, which are also surprising to me. For example, I had forgotten that I made this film at all, right? Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, okay, yeah, right. There was a film called Universal Embassy, which I made in 2004. And then I have to say, I was afraid of looking at it again because I thought it would be, it could be really stupid and embarrassing. <laughs> but I was surprised even by my own work because mm -hmm. in a way it raises relevant questions for today. What does the notion of universal mean, especially in the context of activism? How can we go across, you know, these categories that people are being boxed in, etc.? The film deals with a sans papier project in 2004 in Brussels, where sans papier people, undocumented people, squatted the Somali embassy, which at that time was empty because the Somali state had collapsed. And there were people from all over, you know, North and African countries, also Ukraine, many African countries everywhere that managed to live together in this embassy, even under very con precarious conditions and under constant police pressure. Mm -hmm. But the idea and the ideal was to sort of do it together, you know, mm -hmm. that was great. Yeah. In these particular times, for me, it also almost feels like it's disobedience to say that we get along no matter yeah, what totally. the overarching structures are. Yes. Uh, and this is something I think civil society and the, the disobedience can teach us about discourse and meeting each other. So um, I think I agree with you that this work has more uh, relevance than ever before because it shows this, uh, this different way of meeting each other, right? Yes, and also what I really appreciate is the main protagonist, the mm -hmm. person that was living in this embassy and also running it to some degree, who really analyzes the situation from a materialist point of view, right? Mm -hmm. He is looking at the inhabitants and themselves from the point of view of labor, mm -hmm. of how basically the conditions of capitalism within Western Europe necessitate this influx of undocumented people in order to create a cheap labor force. And it's such a you know, matter of fact, materialist point of view, which I think now is absolutely refreshing. Yeah, it's definitely refreshing, especially when we yeah. move into the realm where we have talked about this a lot, that data is the new oil, is the new way of like replacing this, uh, this is this frontier of uh, coloniality or decoloniality. And I think the archive of, the disobedience archive really 
tunes into this, into the question of how we can f switch this idea around of creating and propagating data, right? Yeah, that's true, but it is also a different kind of network in itself, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's even probably partly analog, you mm -hmm. know, network, not only of basically files that mm -hmm. are collected, but also of people and human relations. So in a way, it's a sort of alter internet in itself. Yeah. yeah, definitely. I think also an interesting thing is that this tunes in a lot with this idea of the genealogy of, of truth and this in the politics of truth, of trying to like creating these, this archive is a uh, it's this catch-22 where, like, by creating the archive, yeah. you create, you're visualizing the truth of these, um, of these stories and striving yeah, yeah. something else. But also, you know, establishing the facticity of these events ever happening, right? Yeah. Because most of them, or many of them, are very humble and small mm -hmm. and, in a way, ephemeral and precarious. Definitely. So, you know, by collecting them and having them, after a while, they really re acquire some kind of historical value, I suppose. Something that I would like to ask you, this has more to do with maybe just like the, the infrastructure of this, but it's something that's very interesting to me. How is the, arc, is there any place where the archive is physically stored or is this a cloud or how, what, uh, is there anything to ensure that this archive will continue existing mm -hmm. beyond the digital realm? Is that something that you think about within this thing? I have no idea to tell you the truth. I was always assuming that it's sitting in Milan because mm -hmm. at the time when it was started to be assembled, <laughs> these were all VHS tapes, you know, or maybe mm -hmm. maybe DV or something like that. I'm not sure they started to collect files really, probably they really started to collect tapes. They might be still somewhere, yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, tapes are very fragile, as I could also immediately see when I went back to the film, the sound track has deteriorated quite a lot, so I have mm -hmm. to go back and clean it and fix it. Mm. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And has there been any, have you had time to look at some of the other uh, works in the, in the exhibition or has there anything that else that has caught your eye <laughs> till now? Well, you know, I'm still completely confused because it's really <laughs> way it's too long. much. Yes, yeah, definitely. yeah, so I mean, I have probably saw something fantastic, but I completely forgot about it. It will come back in three months, I suppose. Yesterday I saw a fantastic hip-hop concert mm -hmm. in a pavilion called the Artist at Risk Pavilion by some, a group of three girls from Kharkiv who are mm -hmm. mainly uh, rapping in Russian but they are from Ethiopia, and it was so fantastic. I mean, this mm. music was so great. It totally blew me away. The golden lion yeah. for that. Yeah, yeah amazing. I mean, th yeah. these encounters is really what makes the yeah. Biennale what it is. Anyway. Yeah. Well, um, I think then, done. Thank you very oh, much for, okay. for your time and yeah. for your insight. Okay. And I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the Biennale. Wonderful. Thank you.